Thank you for joining us. We are currently playing our pre-event slideshow. Blue text on a white background. Welcome, the program will begin shortly. This slide and slides following feature the Schomburg Center Literary Festival branding in the upper right corner with white text in a dark blue bubble with three peach colored droplets overlaid. There is a digital collage image of a black man on the left pictured from the chest up with different shades of brown making up his skin, wearing a patchwork shirt of varying blue patterns and a bird's eye image of a street with two cars on it, one white and one yellow, cutting diagonally across his chest. This slide and all slides following also contain sponsor logos in the bottom right, sponsored by New York Life Foundation, Deutsche Bank America's Foundation, and the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture the New York Public Library. Blue text on a background composed of a light semi-transparent grid of headshots for all of the festival guests. The text reads, for the full schedule, visit www.schombergcenterlitfest.org. Blue text on a white background, The Black Flamingo by Dean Atta with Emil Wilbekin, moderator. September 24th, 2020, 2.30 p.m. EDT. Slide eight. Blue text on a white background. Order the book online from the Schomburg shop, www.schombergshop.com. This slide features a book jacket. Yellow and white text reads, The Black Flamingo, Dean Atta, on a dark background with blue line drawings of flamingos. There is a large image of a young, light-skinned black man with short hair, wearing a bright pink feather boa. He appears in profile with his face and eyes turned slightly toward the viewer. There is a silver circular stamp in the lower left corner, indicating that the book won the American Library Association Stonewall Book Award. Thank you for joining us. We are currently playing our pre-event slideshow. Blue text on a white background. Welcome, the program will begin shortly. This slide and slides following feature the Schomburg Center Literary Festival branding in the upper right corner with white text in a dark blue bubble with three peach colored droplets overlaid. There is a digital collage image of a black man on the left pictured from the chest up with different shades of brown making up his skin, wearing a patchwork shirt of varying blue patterns and a bird's eye image of a street with two cars on it, one white and one yellow, cutting diagonally across his chest. This slide and all slides following also contain sponsor logos in the bottom right, sponsored by New York Life Foundation, Deutsche Bank America's Foundation, and the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture the New York Public Library. Blue text on a background composed of a light semi-transparent grid of headshots for all of the festival guests. The text reads, for the full schedule, visit www.schombergcenterlitfest.org. Blue text on a white background, The Black Flamingo by Dean Atta with Emil Wilbekin, moderator. September 24th, 2020, 2.30 p.m. EDT. Slide eight. Blue text on a white background. Order the book online from the Schomburg shop, www.schombergshop.com. This slide features a book jacket. Yellow and white text reads, The Black Flamingo, Dean Atta, on a dark background with blue line drawings of flamingos. There is a large image of a young, light-skinned black man with short hair, wearing a bright pink feather boa. He appears in profile with his face and eyes turned slightly toward the viewer. There is a silver circular stamp in the lower left corner, 
indicating that the book won the American Library Association Stonewall Book Award. Thank you for joining us. We are currently playing our pre-event slideshow. Blue text on a white background. Welcome, the program will begin shortly. This slide and slides following feature the Schomburg Center Literary Festival branding in the upper right corner with white text in a dark blue bubble with three peach colored droplets overlaid. There is a digital collage image of a black man on the left pictured from the chest up with different shades of brown making up his skin, wearing a patchwork shirt of varying blue patterns and a bird's eye image of a street with two cars on it, one white and one yellow, cutting diagonally across his chest. This slide and all slides following also contain sponsor logos in the bottom right, sponsored by New York Life Foundation, Deutsche Bank America's Foundation, and the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, the New York Public Library. Blue text on a background composed of a light semi-transparent grid of headshots for all of the festival guests. The text reads, for the full schedule, visit www.schombergcenterlitfest.org. Blue text on a white background, The Black Flamingo by Dean Atta with Emil Wilbekin, moderator. September 24th, 2020, 2.30 p.m. EDT. Slide eight. Blue text on a white background. Order the book online from the Schomburg shop, www.schombergshop.com. This slide features a book jacket. Yellow and white text reads, The Black Flamingo, Dean Atta, on a dark background with blue line drawings of flamingos. There is a large image of a young, light-skinned black man with short hair, wearing a bright pink feather boa. He appears in profile with his face and eyes turned slightly toward the viewer. There is a silver circular stamp in the lower left corner, indicating that the book won the American Library Association Stonewall Book Award. Thank you for joining us. We are currently playing our pre-event slideshow Blue text on a white background. Welcome, the program will begin shortly. This slide and slides following feature the Schomburg Center Literary Festival branding in the upper right corner with white text in a dark blue bubble with three peach colored droplets overlaid. There is a digital collage image of a black man on the left pictured from the chest up with different shades of brown making up his skin, wearing a patchwork shirt of varying blue patterns and a bird's eye image of a street with two cars on it, one white and one yellow, cutting diagonally across his chest. This slide and all slides following also contain sponsor logos in the bottom right, sponsored by New York Life Foundation, Deutsche Bank America's Foundation, and the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, the New York Public Library. Blue text on a background composed of a light semi-transparent grid of headshots for all of the festival guests. The text reads, for the full schedule, visit www.schombergcenterlitfest.org. Blue text on a white background, The Black Flamingo by Dean Atta with Emil Wilbekin, moderator. September 24th, 2020, 2.30 p.m. EDT. Hello and welcome back to our Schomburg Festival, Literary Festival. I am your MC for today. My name is Katie Atu Tubman. I'm the Manager of Education Programs and Outreach at the Schomburg Center. And I'm excited to re-invite you if you're returning from our last session with Jacqueline Woodson and LaVar Burton. You're returning to our next program. I'm so excited. This is why A is lit. This festival, as I mentioned before, before continues to expand the Schomburg's long tradition of championing 
authors of African descent from all across the globe and publications that celebrate Black history and culture. And I really mean it about all across the globe because one of our incredible authors today is coming all the way from Scotland. So be sure to follow us on social media, follow the schedule at Schomburg Center litfest.org just to know what's happening throughout the week. We have so much more in store for you. We also want you to remain engaged. Follow us on social media at Schomburg Center and use the chat right there, the chat on your screen to submit questions and comments. And please, you know, try to keep them as PG as possible. Kids are watching. Um, but at this time, we will also do our best to get to as many as your questions as possible. There will be a Q&A following this, this panel discussion, this conversation after this program. Please be mindful again of your fellow audiences. Uh, we are recording this program for archive. It's the Schomburg Center, y'all. That's what we do. But please know that the audience, you, will not be a part of that recording. Now, for the reason we are all here, I would like to introduce our next panel discussion on the Black Flamingo by Dean Atta with Emil Wilberkin. The Black Flamingo is profound. It's actually one of my favorite books I love to teach, actually. Um, it is written in prose, and it's just incredibly stunning. Uh, a giant plus, I like to tell my students that it, it discusses themes on adolescence, identity, sexuality, gender, racism, colorism, and healing. And as an educator with high school students, this is a text I highly recommend by a writer I strongly admire. Dean Addo was recently named one of the one of the most influential LGBT people in UK by The Independent. It was actually this past Sunday. His debut poetry collection, I Am Nobody's Nigger, was shortlisted for the Polari First Book Prize. His debut novel, The Black Flamingo, was awarded the 2020 Stonewall Book Award and shortlisted for the CILIP Carnegie Medal, YA Book Prize, and Jalak Prize. His writing deals with themes of race, gender, sexuality, and has appeared on BBC and Channel 4 and his, and his, and his regular column for Attitude Magazine. You can follow him online at www.deanadda.com. Dean will be reading an excerpt from The Black Flamingo today. You can also order this book at the Schomburg Shop. Please remember to go to schomburgshop.com to order any of the books we're featuring throughout this festival. Following the reading, Dean Ada will be joined by Emil Wibikin. And I just got to tell you, first you got Dean and now you got Emil and it's just going to be explosive because Emil is a creative and a strategic media marketing and branding professional. And he's also an on-air TV personality living in New York City, New York. He is also the president and chief creative officer of World of Wibikin, also known as WOW a multimedia content brand that does all things digital, print, social media, video, and live events. Wilbekin is also the founder of Native Sun, a platform created to inspire and empower Black gay men. I want you to welcome Dean Ada for our reading, and then afterwards we'll have Emil join for a conversation. Welcome, Dean. Hello. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, and I'm so Glad to be here. So grateful to be part of this program. It's phenomenal. So hello to everyone if you're watching live. Hello if you're watching this sometime in the future. Um, I hope it's a happy place there in the future. Um, but we're going to have fun now and I'm going to read to you from The Black Flamingo. And um, I'm really excited to introduce this book to you. So The Black Flamingo is the story of Michael, who is a black gay teenage boy growing up in London and going to university and discovering a passion for drag performance. And lots happens in this book. Um, you actually meet Michael when he's six years old and you follow him all the way up to 19 years old. Um, so it's kind of a, a sweeping view of someone's childhood with the kind of key moments um, kind of pulled out in poetry. So this is a novel in verse. And so I'm able to kind of like skip through and read you different parts of the book in my short reading now. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. And the first bit is the very beginning. This is the prologue. I am the black flamingo. The black flamingo is me trying to find myself. This book is a fairy tale in which I am the prince and the princess. I am the king and the queen. I am my own wicked witch and fairy godmother. This book is a fairy tale 
in which I'm cursed and blessed by others. But finally, I am the fairy finding my own magic. When female flamingos lay eggs in the zoo, the eggs are taken from them and put into incubators. The zookeepers give dummy eggs to flamingo couples to nest with, while the zookeepers watch their behavior to figure out who will make the best flamingo parents. When the incubated eggs are almost ready to hatch, they decide which couple will be given normal eggs and which will be left with those that never contained precious life. I often feel like a bad egg that was not meant to be, like a dummy egg cracked open, an impossible thing, but somehow living and thriving, defying zookeepers' intentions, an experiment they watch and patiently wait to see what might become of me, to see how I survive without complete love. And I'm gonna jump forward now. Um, so that was Michael's kind of introduction in the prologue there, but now we're going deep into the story and it's the first sighting of the Black Flamingo. So as I said, Michael has grown up in London, but he's got family from both Jamaica and Cyprus. So he's a mixed race or biracial, as you say, in the States. And um, he goes to visit his family in Cyprus for the first time. And um, there's a sighting of a real Black Flamingo and that speaks to him. And this is what happens. Grandad goes back inside. He draws my attention to the news. The story, a black flamingo has landed on the island. An expert on screen explaining it is the opposite of an albino. Too much melanin, he says. Camera pans the salt lake full of pink, but the eye is drawn to that one black body in the flamboyance. The following evening, my beach towel and shorts dry on the balcony. Couples on mopeds ride past the house. Dogs walk humans before dinner. Grandad coughs violently and then lights another cigarette. Grandma calls us in to eat. The black flamingo is on the news again. I pick the dining chair facing the TV. Grandad asks, why does it matter if he's black? Adding, the other flamingos don't care. And I am certain what he's saying is I love you. And another section I want to read is when Michael is going to university, his Jamaican uncle is driving him there. And um, this is what happens. Uncle B drives me and my stuff to university. He tells me how proud he is and asks what I'm excited about and what I'm nervous about. I don't tell him I'm excited and nervous about meeting guys, having sex, maybe a relationship. I tell him I'm excited to have my freedom. We're five minutes from our destination, according to his GPS, and we hear sirens and see flashing lights. It's the police behind us. My uncle pulls over, I think at first to let them pass, but I soon realize they are pulling us over. They ask my uncle if this is his car, to see his license, where we are going. They tell him it's a very nice car, ask him what he does for a living. My usually polite uncle is abrupt with the police, asks what business they have stopping him. Was he speeding? Was there a problem with one of his lights? Did he fit the description of a suspect they're looking for? The police say we can be on our way and to have a nice day. They get back in their car and drive away. Are you okay? I ask. Uncle B begins. There's always something, no matter how hard you work, no matter how well you do, how successful or respectable, there's always something that will remind you you shouldn't get too comfortable. I always thought education and money was going to earn me respect, but a successful black man is a threat. Pulling me over for driving a nice car, this isn't what I wanted for your moving day, but this is what it's like to be black in this country or anywhere in the world. They interrupt our joy, our history, our progress. They know they can't stop us unless they kill us, but they can't kill us all. So you're living your life and suddenly surrounded by white fear or suspicion. They fear sharing anything. Our success is a threat. I've never heard my uncle speak in these terms of them and us. I've never thought in these terms until today. 
and I'll share one more part with you. Um, so you can hear different parts of Michael's identity. And um, this is a, a poem that kind of reflects a bit more on that. And it's called, I Come From. I come from shepherd's pie and Sunday roast, jerk chicken and stuffed grape leaves. I come from traveling through my taste buds, but loving where I live. I come from a home that some would call broken. I come from DIY that never got done. I come from waiting by the phone for him to call. I come from waving the white flag to loneliness. I come from the rainbow flag and the union jack. I come from a British passport and an ever ready suitcase. I come from jet fuel and fresh coconut water. I come from crossing oceans to find myself. I come from deep issues and shallow solutions. I come from a limited vocabulary, but an unrestricted imagination. I come from a decent education and a marvelous mother. I come from being given permission to dream, but choosing to wake up instead. I come from wherever I lay my head. I come from unanswered questions and unread books, unnoticed efforts and undelivered apologies and thanks. I come from who I trust and who I have left. I come from last year and last year and I don't notice how I've changed. I come from looking in the mirror and looking online to find myself. I come from stories, myths, legends and folk tales. I come from lullabies and pop songs, hip hop and poetry. I come from griots, grandmothers and her storytellers. I've come from published words and strangers smiles. I come from my own pen, but I see people torn apart like paper, each a story or a poem that never made it into a book. Okay, so that's enough of me on my own. I'd like to welcome Emil to have a conversation. Please come join me, Emil. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, thank, you. thank you. This is a pleasure to be in conversation with you today. Oh, for me too. For me too. So where do we begin? Well, it's so funny because you took, you stole my thunder. Oh. And read, no, no, no. It's great. You read the two sections I wanted to reference. So I was oh. like, great minds think alike. <laughs> um, I wanted, so as a journalist and a content curator, I'm always very fascinated with um, people's origin stories and the process of artists and how they create their work. So I'd love to start with you with the symbolism of the Black Flamingo. Um, why did you choose the Black Flamingo? Yes, yeah, so um, there was that real sighting of a black flamingo in Cyprus, and that was in 2015. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I was actually there visiting my family um, and kind of had a very similar uh, experience where, you know, my grandfather was like, what's the big deal? Like, he didn't say those perfect words that I put in the book, but um, yeah. I like to imagine, well, I, I use my real life experience to kind of um, embellish and then turn into fiction. Um, so... Sure. Yeah, it was, for me, when I saw the Black Flamingo, it gave me so many feelings. Um, so many memories came kind of flooding back of like going to gay clubs and being one of the only black people there, um, being, you know, in a family where, you know, my mom's side of the family are white and my dad's side of the family are black. So when I'm with my mom's family, it's just me and my sister, you know, who have brown skin. And so that is kind of the experience, you know, I'd go to Cyprus and I used to have long locks and people used to call me Bob Marley and want to touch my hair, you know? And um, yeah, so, so many experiences where I felt like I stood out. Um, but when I saw the Black Flamingo, the Black Flamingo stood out, but it was fabulous. And, and I just kind of, I looked up stuff to do with flamingos and I found out that a group of flamingos is called a flamboyance. And so that was perfect. Uh -huh. um, and I kind of just, I was int I'd always been interested in drag, but I'd never done it. Um, mm -hmm. And so the Black Flamingo as a concept just lended itself to putting on like feathers and yeah. heels and standing on one leg and, and having fun. And so I actually enrolled in a course called The Art of Drag. And mm -hmm. this was at 30 years old, I tried out drag for the first time. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, I wish I'd done this as a teenager. <laughs> I wish I'd allowed myself to go there. Yeah. And that's yeah. where the idea for the story came from. It would be like, you know, what would it be like for a teenage boy like me to have done this much earlier and how liberated he might have felt? Because, um, yeah, drag is an amazing experience. Um, and have you ever done it? I have not done it. 
Oh, you will feel so free. I, I recommend it. I highly recommend it. I need to do it. It's I've never done it. And I've um, obviously been very curious about it. And it's such a huge part of our Black gay and queer culture. Um, but I haven't. And I. it's funny, when I was researching you, I saw this really beautiful video um, that you did. And so tell me about the experience of creating that video. Oh, that video was um, so much fun. And another huge honor, because I was actually... Um, along with my friend Ben Connors, we were artists in residence at the Tate Britain Gallery in London. And it was just amazing. And we got it by asking. Like, it was just a simple thing where we, we do, me and Ben, we both do lots of education work with young people. We work in galleries and go into schools. And so I, I had worked with the Tate Gallery, doing workshops, getting young people to respond to the art. Um, but then this kind of idea came and I was like, I want my own exhibition, like I want to be the art. And so it was that, it was like dressing up as the flamingo um, and being in the gallery, um, helping other people to think about their personality and characters. It wasn't, I wasn't getting other people to dress up, but I was getting them to like write about themselves in metaphors. And um, Ben was helping them to like do their own like drawings and artwork. And yeah, making the video, I got to walk around the gallery and drag turning heads and people like asking what it was about. And, you know, it was just really wonderful because at that time I hadn't written The Black Flamingo as a novel. I was just toying with the concept and I was just having fun and um, just seeing what it meant to embody The Black Flamingo and take it into different spaces. So as well as the Tate, I also performed in, um, you know, queer clubs, um, a, a kind of really well-known club in London called the Royal Vauxhall Tavern, which is um, kind of just an iconic venue and so important to the London queer and UK wide queer community. Um, so to have done my first performance there and my second performance in the Tate Gallery, I was just like on cloud nine and it just kind of, um, yeah, just kind of the ball kept rolling from there and right. people wanted to know more about the Black Flamingo. And I felt like, okay, a novel um, could be the way to do this because I, I can't get everywhere, just me. But if you if you put this kind of experience into a book, then that can get everywhere. So that was part of it as well. But the video as well, putting um, some of those poems online in, in video and performance um, mm -hmm. was a great way to kind of start um, sharing this idea and um, and it kept growing. And I love, I love the metaphor of the Black Flamingo, like standing out and being the only one. Mm. Um, and, and to your point, being flamboyant, right? And I think about what we're going through right now with you know, being in quarantine and, and isolated, uh, but also the whole racial equity protests that we're seeing globally and how people now want to be seen. And yeah. so in many ways, the Black Flamingo is celebrating that, celebrating the Black body as it were. Yeah, yeah. and it, it's kind of about feeling like you're the only one, but once you put yourself out there, you mm -hmm. find your flock, you know, other Black queer people come flocking to you. And it's just, that's the beautiful thing about it. Once we put our head up, you know, other people see us and they're like, you're like me, Let, let's be in community. And I think that's something <laughs> that I've always valued, you know, spaces, whether they're online or real life spaces to be with other Black queer people are so important. And so, yeah, it's just, it was really important for me to create um, the opportunity to, to bring people together. So behind the scenes, I was also um, have been doing Black Flamingo salons where I bring Black queer writers together um, in that. private, you know, safe spaces where we just yeah. get together and, 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 and write. And because and, as a writer, you know, a Black and queer writer, you know, mm -hmm. you go to writing workshops and writing groups um, or even in publishing, you can sometimes feel like you're having to explain yourself from the ground up. And so sometimes it's really nice to be in a group where people understand you kind of implicitly. They've lived some of the same experiences as you, so you don't have to explain everything. Um, so that's community for me is really important. And um, yeah, being seen, but not just for the sake of yourself being seen so that other people can see you and know that there's someone like them out there, you know, um, that kind of being not just a role model, but like kind of saying, hey, come over here, let's gather together, like, and, and yeah. be together. 
Yeah, and you know, it's so it's so interesting as we were talking right before about Native Sun. And so Native Sun, the concept of Native Sun is just that. It is to create community and fellowship with Black, gay, and queer men because we do often feel like we're the only ones. And so when we come together, what I've found, and I think you're kind of, of talking about this with the flamingos, is like we become stronger together, right? We're because it's okay. We mm -hmm. see our beauty and our brilliance, and it's not odd, it's actually kind of amplified. Yeah. And one of the things um, that we talk about too is um, it's named after James Baldwin's Notes of a Native Son. And so I really think about Black queer literature and Black gay literature and how important it is to the canon. Of, of global literature, who are your literary inspirations like when you were growing up and now? Growing up, I think definitely Maya Angelou was a huge one for me. And I think, cause her poetry is so accessible, um, mm -hmm. but really speaks um, to not just a female experience, not just a black experience, but to an experience of someone who's been, you know, oppressed and, and undermined and undervalued. And I think I had felt that myself and I felt, like she was, you know, speaking about a very different life to mine, but yet I kind of felt really connected to what she was saying and how clearly she said it, you know, it's, it's really articulate in the most simplest terms possible, you know, you get it, like I feel like most people could get exactly what Maya Angelou's saying and I think that's really a skill to be that poignant but that kind of simple and clear. Um, so I think her poetry and that was what I was aiming for really, you know, with, with my writing, especially when I was younger, I just wanted to make myself understood. Um, like I, I've talked about earlier, wanting, um, you know, feeling like you have to explain yourself to people. And, you know, I, rather than have to do that in every interaction, if I can write a poem that says it, that just yeah. puts it out there, then there it is. Um, and so often it was like, when I felt like I'd been having certain conversations over and over again, I'd write a poem that would kind of like just, here we go, this is how I feel about this subject, you know, so I've got poems called like Young, Black and Gay, and I've got poems um, called, you know, I am nobody's N-word, you know, because I just needed to say the certain things and poetry helped me with that. And so, yeah, Maya Angelou, Gil Scott Heron as well, yeah. uh, for the kind of vulnerability and, and yet strength, you know, in kind of laying it all out there. I feel like he, he kind of really um, showed, you know, a lot of ugliness in his poetry. And I think that's really important. Um, you know, it's powerful, it was uh, political, uh, but it didn't shy away from dark and ugly stuff. And I think that's really important as well. And I think poetry can, can do that really effectively. Um, so they were the main two. And I, and, I, and I kind of, I loved spoken word poetry as well. So like um, when I first heard Ursula Rucker, uh, wow. from Philadelphia I heard on the Roots album and I was just my mind was blown because I wasn't so like in tune with it like until that point and when I heard her I was like let me get all of her albums let me find out more and then I was like oh my gosh there's so much spoken word out there and you know I, I started seeing what was coming out you know when Deaf Poetry Jam was like super big and everyone was watching that I was just like I want to be there I want to do that like um, so I think that really inspired me so um, cause yeah, I wasn't a big reader when I was younger. I am dyslexic and I didn't know that for a long time. I found out when I was at university um, and it kind of, yeah, I, I don't think I, I, I realized how much it had restricted me from like really getting into reading novels. Um, but because of the short form of poetry, I found that was the thing I, I was kind of drawn towards. And so I could, you know, read poetry books and watch spoken word and and feel like that was manageable. But when I was presenting with a novel, even when I was studying them at school and university, I I was, you know, exhausted oh. by novels. <laughs> I never thought I'd write one. That was like a shock to me that I've written a novel. But well, I, love, I love that you wrote it though in verse. Like it yeah. makes the for me it's like it just drew me in. And well, that was easy because I could do it one poem at a time. You yeah. know, I didn't, I obviously it's got an overarch, 
touching story, but I could take it one poem at a time. And, um, you know, some are quite short and some go over several pages, but it, it was just manageable for me. And um, I enjoyed it that way. And, you know, the editing process was like, I'd written all the poems and then we kind of like move them around and see where they fit together to tell the story in the best way. And that was really fun as well. So um, yeah, novels in verse, like recently reading like The Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo and um, Jason Reynolds' Long Way Down and Jacqueline Woodson's Brown Girl Dreaming, like those kind of books really have given me a template to write The Black Flamingo actually. They were, um, you know, seeing what's happening in YA with novels in verse, that was really exciting to me. And I was like, I want to be part of that. That's I cool. <laughs> So when, with poetry, did you, when did you start? Like, when did you, as a child, like, when did you start writing it or, or speaking it? Um, I started, I mean, I, I've always loved words and performance and I did acting as a child. So um, I was in the West End Theatre in, in London. So I was in a musical of Oliver and the musical of Bugsy Malone in the West End. And so I was used to being on stage. I was used to like, um, reciting other people's words you know whether it's in song form or or my kind of like lines on stage um but when it came to writing my own poetry I did that when I was a teenager but I kept it very private because I was writing about very private things you know I was writing about my dad not being around um I have so many poems about my dad not being around but the one that I've actually put into the world is called Fatherless Nation and that was really tough to write and tough to perform and for the first kind of year or two of having that poem to share it was it I felt like I was exposing a huge vulnerability you know over and over again um but it seemed to really connect with people um who have had a similar experience whether their dad had not been around had left had died you know not having that a parent is a really strong thing and it, and it affects people in different ways but it affects us all um if it happens and so um yeah, and I wrote poems about my sexuality, kind of figuring it out. Mm -hmm. I wrote poems about being, you know, mixed race, um, yeah. but, you know, feeling like, am I not black enough or, you know, but I know I'm not white. So like, and I right. think that kind of identity was a, a real kind of preoccupation in my early writing. And now I can quite comfortably say I'm black, you know, and, and kind of say it in a political way and know I'm standing in solidarity, but accept that I have privilege as well as a light-skinned person so yeah but that I got to write my way through that and figure that out so that was all through my teens and 20s and um, doing open mic nights and slams and um, yeah and then in my kind of late 20s putting out my first poetry collection mm -hmm. and um, yeah so it's been my whole like life really um, and yeah it's, it's my way of um, having a dialogue with the world you know I don't feel like I talk a lot, but I don't feel the most articulate when I talk. I feel much you're more articulate. articulate, so please. <laughs> no, you're um, very, very articulate. I mean, I think about, um, you know, what you are, are writing about and what you're talking about. And what do you want young people to understand, especially all these intersections, right? About being mixed race and about figuring out your sexuality. What, what do you want them to take away? there's no rush with it um you know if we have time there's another poem i could read called how to come out as gay and it gives a lot of advice to young people and i think that would be my 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 biggest takeaway and it could apply to any kind of identity or any kind of coming out it's not just sexuality you can come out in lots of other ways but i think it's not a, a done deal. You don't come out and then it's done because you end up coming out over and over again. Like, you, right. and your identity shifts throughout your lifetime. You know, I don't think I'm the finished version of myself right now, you know, but when I was younger, I thought I was. Every kind of year that passed, I was like, this is the best I'm gonna be. Like, um, and then you realize actually we're always learning, developing, growing, changing our minds, making mistakes, making amends, you know, and um, there's some relationships that kind of, come and go in your life and there's there's some kind of um preoccupations that come and go in in cycles and so i just think yeah if we if we are fortunate to live a long life we're going to be many people and um so don't think you're you're done learning growing or changing it's always gonna it's always gonna be the case that's what, the message what was your coming out story 
Um, I came out at 15 and um, it was, yeah, pretty young and I was in a, a religious school. And so it was quite a big deal, but at the same time, um, it just needed to be done. Like, because um, there was a boy I liked and, and I wanted to ask him out. And, and so <laughs> I did, um, because I didn't want to be left out. Everyone was like getting girlfriends, boyfriends. And I was like, well, I think, I think he, he, he's cute. Let me ask yeah. him out. And then he said, no. But, oh. <laughs> but like, it was fine because then another friend was like, oh, I know a gay guy, let me introduce you. <laughs> and so, um, and then I had my first boyfriend, he went to another school, but like, um, I think it was quite, um, yeah, it was, it was quite easy going in the end. Like there was ups and downs internally, because yeah. I think when you grow up uh, religious and you kind of sin and like, sin, and like um, that, what, what that means and, and, and kind of what you've been told it means, it, it can be really overwhelming for a young person to kind of deal with that. Like, and so it kind of, it made me stop and question um, how my relationship with, with God was gonna be going forward. Um, and it was, it was it, that was the difficult part. It wasn't, there wasn't bullying, there wasn't anyone rejecting me in school, in my family, but I had to kind of reckon with how I wanted to move forward in in kind of my religious life and so that is something that I still don't have an answer to I'm like I hope Krista Tippett doesn't ask me to go on on being because I could not answer her questions yet <laughs> like, um but it was just like yeah you know it's, it's 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 tough to kind of figure out where you stand in in, in kind of um with the concepts that you grew up with and then you know who you are challenges those concepts quite drastically um, yeah. and I'm sure lots of people can relate to that for different reasons so did yeah you, did you get to work through a lot of that in writing the Black Flamingo um no because I think Michael doesn't figure that out he kind of just has other things to worry about like so religion is kind of fades away he just kind of stops mentioning God yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know at the beginning he talks about God and um and then he just doesn't um and so you can make of that what you will really um but I I am still reckoning with it and I've, I've written a, a poem recently that's been published in an anthology and it's the poem is called uh, two black boys in paradise and it's imagining two black boys in the garden of eden and you know so i i, I dare to go there you know i still want to write about it i still want to like explore it and yeah. i don't know exactly how how far i'll go with that exploration but i've got at least um, a poem that kind of like discusses it from my perspective um and kind of it's it's an ongoing process, like I said, with all aspects of our identity, you know, and our inner life, you know, we're always changing our minds and, and figuring out new things about ourselves. Yes. With that, would you mind reading the um, your poem that you were going to read from, oh, the, yeah. Thank from you. the epilogue? Yes, it is the epilogue. So I it doesn't mark that. <laughs> There's no spoilers, but it does come at the end of the book, but kind of the, the story's concluded and this is kind of the epilogue. How to come out as gay. Don't. Don't come out unless you want to. Don't come out for anyone else's sake. Don't come out because you think society expects you to. Come out for yourself. Come out to yourself. Shout, sing it, softly stutter. Correct those who say they knew before you did. That's not how sexuality works. It's yours to define. Being effeminate doesn't make you gay. Being sensitive doesn't make you gay. Being gay makes you gay. Be a bit gay. Be very gay. Be the glitter that shows up in unexpected places. Be typing on WhatsApp, but leave them waiting. Throw a party for yourself, but don't invite anyone else. Invite everyone to your party, but show up late or not at all. If you're unhappy in the closet, but afraid of what's outside, leave the door ajar and call out. If you're happy in the closet for the time being, play dress up until you find the right outfit. Don't worry, it's okay to say you're gay and later exchange it for something else that suits you, fits, feels better. Watch movies that make it seem a little less scary. Beautiful thing, moonlight. Be South East London, a daytime dance floor, his head resting on your shoulder. Be South Beach, Miami, night of water and fire your head resting on his shoulder. 
be the fabric of his shirt, the muscles in his shoulder, your shoulder, be the bricks, be the sand, be the river, be the ocean. Remember, your life is not a movie, except you'll be coming out for your whole life. Accept advice from people and sources you trust. If your mother warns you about STDs within minutes of you coming out, try to understand that she loves you and is afraid. If you come out at 15, this is not a badge of honor. It doesn't matter what age you come out. Be a beautiful thing. Be the moonlight too. Remember, you have the right to be proud. Remember, you have the right to be you. Uh, I love that so much. And it's it literally takes me through my own kind of coming out process. Um, and I, I, I agree with you. I think it's kind of a constant evolution. Like we kind of come out multiple times mm. um, in multiple spaces. I'm sure this book for you in many ways is like another coming out. Mm. Um, because you're yeah. well, to a bigger to a bigger audience and um, <laughs> Much bigger. kind of saying you know drawing the parallels of you know my own story and Michael's story but knowing that they're they're different like this is a work of fiction but it's used some of my life as inspiration but then people read into it like they've read my autobiography and it's like no <laughs> um, yeah, yeah I read the quote that you said which was really great which you said you had to make sure that you kept your your adult voice out of it and kind of really tapped in. Talk about that process a little bit. Um, so I think I've been really fortunate in the process of writing the book. I got to speak to lots of young people because I do lots of work in schools. So I got to um, share excerpts as I was working on it with school groups and get their feedback. And um, also went to my old university and stayed on campus and observed what university is like again and um, shared with students um, that, you know, what I was working on and got their feedback. And I guess I had to see it as if, you know, you know, through the eyes of Michael at the age he was at yeah. the different points in the book. So I had to get the voice right. I didn't want to be, um, you know, I didn't want you to hear the adult kind of any judgment, any kind of, um, you know, adult knowledge coming in there. The only time you hear from adults is, you know, his uncle, his grandfather, his mum, you know, and so you get to hear from adults, but Michael receives that and it's like, aha, uh -huh, that's new information. And so, you know, it, it was it was good because you get to see him learning and growing and and through the book, you know, his vocabulary expands, his understanding of the world and his kind of reading the nuances in different situations develops. But when he's younger, he can't see some of the things that are happening. Like when he's six years old and his mom doesn't want him to take his Barbie doll out of the house, he doesn't actually know why. His mom tells him that she needs the Barbie to help her clean. <laughs> like, and, it's like, and he just accepts that. He's like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, right. okay, I'll leave Barbie at home to help mom. Like that doesn't really, but then, you know, and if it had been, even a teenage voice and reflecting on that moment, it wouldn't have worked. So I had to write him in that moment, actually six years old. That's why you meet him at six and then he grows up so that you can see things through his eyes all the way. Um, so yeah, it was, it was really, it was really a, a, a fun experiment to kind of get the voice right. And, you know, the early parts of the book, you could read it to, to younger people, um, two six year olds, but then when he's, in his teens, it's teenage stuff happening. So don't read that to six year olds. Um, <laughs> I love that. What, so you, you do workshops and you do teaching. Talk to me about some of the work that you do and, and, and what you've learned from the young people. Um, I, I learn from young people that it's just, they need to be told that their stories matter, that, they, um, that people wanna, hear from them and so you know I think young people often think you know the only stories that matter are the ones that are published in books but I found you know through doing performance poetry and slam that you know getting young people to stand up and speak their words aloud is so empowering obviously like if you can get them to be published as well or make videos that's really cool um, but just the in the moment sharing and being heard by their peers by their teachers um, if you organize a showcase and get their parents or carers there, it's so empowering and it can really build so many bridges of understanding. And so 
that was, you know, the biggest thing for me uh, of doing that kind of work is that, you know, it, it, it's just giving people permission. Um, and, um, you know, you don't actually have to teach people to write, like they have stories, you know, they have something to say. And what's most important is to tell them that they can say it their way, you know, they can use the vocabulary that they use amongst their friends, they can use the other language that they might speak at home you know they can they can put in references that only maybe people their age will get that is fine it doesn't have to be writing for you know a mainstream audience it's about you and whoever you want to speak to and i think that's um what i've really enjoyed doing work with young people and with adults as well because i don't think that goes away i think people think there's one way to write and that's the kind of way that you kind of have been taught in school with the certain books that you get shown. But now I'm really glad that schools are, are kind of opening up what they're um, exposing young people to and using um, a more diverse range of books and curriculums are slowly um, changing and, uh, and becoming much better and more diverse. So I'm glad to see that happening. Um, it's a lot, it's been a long time coming, right? <laughs> Well, it's also interesting. I mean, I was I was so thrilled to read your book because, you know, there's so many young people who are coming out earlier and they're identifying as um, non gender non-conforming earlier, they're non-binary, and they just don't want to be in any boxes. And I think the Black Flamingo gives them the the possibility of being whatever they are, whoever they are. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I yeah, and I'm I'm grateful to have been given uh, the opportunity to to kind of write for young people because I was doing the workshops for young people but for some reason I hadn't figured I could write YA um, and I had to be you know kind of not convinced but like um, yeah persuaded uh, by my agent and editor to kind of like give it a go and I was like okay cool um, and it's it's been yeah the, the best thing and I'm, I'm excited I'm writing another YA right now and it's uh, mm -hmm. It's, it's so much fun, um, you know, going there to that, that time where anything feels possible, you know, it's, it's such a, a kind of fertile, you know, time of life where, you know, you've got, obviously everyone has challenges, but I think young people are so, have so much potential and possibility and are really open to what the world um, might look like for them in the future. And I think that's why often we really like lean on them to to think of how to save the planet and how to like fix the mistakes of the adults but that's not what it should be uh, but I just think yeah I can see why people are tempted to think young people have all the answers but what they have is they don't have as many barriers they don't have as many mental blocks um, they're kind of more open to to different um, kind of ways of dealing with problems whereas I think us adults have thought, oh, we've tried it that way. We can't, that's not going to work. Whereas young people haven't tried it that way yet. So they want to do it. Like they want to just go out there and give it a go and, and see if they can fix things or shake things up or knock things down. And I think that's the great thing about, you know, youthful energy and, and enthusiasm um, towards change. Possibilities, all the possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. um, so one other thing before we go to q and I... Yeah wanted to, um, the other, the section I did tag that you have not yet tapped into, uh -huh. next section, mom brings me a magazine from the beach shop, mm. a, a gay lifestyle magazine called Attitude with Tom Daly on the cover, The Body Issue. Mm -hmm. I've already looked at Attitude's website on my phone when my mom hands me the physical copy. I feel like she's giving me her blessing. Mm. Inside the magazine, the advice is to set, accept and love your body, no matter how you look. I don't think about my skinny physique often, but here I can't help myself. Um, I don't know where to look with all the nearby naked male bodies because you're at the beach. Um, so talk to me about that. I think that's something else that comes up a lot with young people is kind of body positivity and how we accept ourselves. And we're really seeing a shift and from it being kind of one way to look, kind of Eurocentric way, and now accepting, you know, curvy or thin or whatever people are. Um, talk to me a little bit about that part and kind of exploring that in this book. Um, in the book, it was um, a case of Michael seeing men with muscles and sporty guys and having a crush on, you know, one guy at school who's black and very sporty and, and another guy at school who's like this scruffy ginger white boy who looks a bit like Ed Sheeran, but like, um, but a yeah, a little bit. And so he kind of like has 
these kind of ideas of, of guys he finds attractive, but he doesn't necessarily know what he thinks of himself. Like, um, you know, what, who finds him attractive? He hasn't kind of experienced that yet. Like to know what people find attractive about him and the, the kind of the time, one time he goes to a club, like there's some kind of fetishization of his blackness that happens and he finds that really unsettling, you know, and I've had those experiences and I didn't want to go too far with that um, in this book, but it was something that I wanted to touch upon because it, it does happen. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I, I wanted to kind of think about, you know, Michael exploring his body not just for what it looks like um, but also what it can do and by that I don't mean sex I mean like dressing up performing like being fabulous being on stage and so that was really interesting um, way of looking at the body like because he's got you know there's one character in there that's very sporty and that's yeah. how he you know uses his body but then and, and Michael finds that admirable and, and attractive but then that's not Michael's thing and so dressing up and being on stage and and exploring his femininity that's his way of kind of exploring his body and how he wants to present himself um mm -hmm. and yeah that was really really fun and he's in a drag kind of troupe at university and yeah. so there's drag kings and drag queens and people that are playing with gender in different ways and you know they lend each other costumes and clothes and and um yeah there's no one way to do this thing called drag and I think that for Michael is his way of exploring um you know what his body is about um just one way because there's so many ways we can do it and I don't know I, he doesn't he doesn't have any like major insecurities um you know there's a there's there's for fun his his mom buys him some speedos and they think it's a hilarious joke yeah. um but he's like can I wear these is this okay and he tries them on in his bedroom and he twerks and like <laughs> but he doesn't actually dare to wear them to the beach um he just takes some you know trunks um oversized trunks so he doesn't kind of draw too much attention to himself so but he has a pair of pink speedos um so and i think his mom constantly tries to affirm him you know mm -hmm. giving him that magazine giving him the speedos if he wants you know to try them um and you know giving him the barbie doll when he was six years old so um he he has the support but he has to find i guess the courage and he does by the end of the book and um that was the journey i guess i wanted to to take him on. I love that, I love that. Thank you. We have um, a few questions in our chat box. So um, who are your favorite black queer writers working now or today? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, Dennis Smith, the poet, yeah. um, incredible um, person. And I've, I've met them a couple of times when they visited the UK and um, they just are a stunning performer. Their work is beautiful on the page, but you have to see them perform. Like it's just another level. Um, and so, yeah, and the way they write about blackness, queerness, uh, HIV, you know, um, police brutality, like they just go straight for it. Like what I was saying about kind of Gil Scott Heron really going to the dark places. I think Denez does that in, in a really stunning way with amazing craft and skill as well. Um, a British poet called Travis Alabanza, um, who is incredible. Um, they're a poet and a performer. Um, they um, make one person shows and they also do lots of different things with arts and visuals, collaborating with people um, and they're a um, trans non-binary person and they just really shake things up um, in, in kind of the literature world, in the arts world, um, online. If you find them on Instagram or Twitter, you'll see that. Them, I just wrote yeah. their name down. Um, so they are, are two of my kind of like favorites, absolute favorites. Um, and then there's, there's just so many um, out there. Um, there's an amazing poet called Yersa Daly Ward, um, who has a book called Bone and a kind of a memoir called The Terrible. Um, and they are really, really incredible. Um, so I'd recommend um, Yersa Daly Ward as well. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to like list loads of my friends. I'm going to stop. <laughs> Let's have a <laughs> it's just really hard because you know we know each other um yeah. it's like it's a it's a community and um there's, there's there's so many um amazing voices but i think you know for starters if people check those three out um then there's so many other places to go after as well so related to that someone said uh, who are your lgbtqi plus icons icons wow um i mean <laughs> 
Frank Ocean is actually one. Mm -hmm. And I think what I find really interesting about how Frank did it is like, you know, Frank Ocean was so well known and then he kind of came out in a quite ambiguous way. And I think that's kind of the future. I think there's, there's, there's coming out, you know, and, and, you know, defining what you are, but there's also saying, well, I'm not within, you know, I'm not within the binary or I'm not within the kind of like um, straight or gay. I'm just me. Like, and I think a lot of young people are leaning that way as well. And I think that's quite, um, admirable I think because it's it's actually more challenging because you're not necessarily putting yourself straight in a clear defined box that then people can understand you and you can find your you know community so to speak you're still existing in liminal kind of spaces you know and it's 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 quite um it's quite interesting you know I think yesterday was um by visibility day and um and I think it's really um, still quite difficult for bi people or people who don't want to like um, define as as gay or straight or one thing or the other and so I just find yeah when someone can just say hey I'm me and I've had relationships with these people and I might have relationships with these people who knows I, I find that quite um, quite interesting so Frank Ocean is one for sure but then also like you know, Angela Davis, Audre Lord, James Baldwin, you know, um, a poet called Essex Hemphill. Um, there's, there's lots of people that, um, that have been kind of instrumental. And then people that are a bit closer to me, like um, Ajamu X and Topher Campbell and Campbell X, they're all kind of um, Black British um, arts people, like filmmakers, photographers and, and theatre directors. And, um, you know, so there's a lot of amazing people around me. There's a person called Lady Phil who set up UK Black Pride, which is a, a pride celebration um, for um, Black queer people and um, was and is, you know, a place that I find the kind of real sense of community. It happens usually in August. It didn't happen this year, um, but um, it's been you know, every year, the place where I go and feel rejuvenated and filled with like enthusiasm and energy to kind of, you know, represent this community because you get to see so many Black queer people together in the daytime, you know, not in a club at night, not in a small gathering, but like hundreds of us, thousands of us together. And I think when I see that, I feel so empowered going forward. Amazing, amazing. So we have another question. Um... How do you respond to people who think having conversations with youth about sexuality, especially in schools, is inappropriate? I don't respond to them. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's clearly not. <laughs> okay, next. So, um, wow, what advice would you give young writers? Um, where should they start? And you touched on this a little, but if you could give us a little bit more yeah, detail. I think, I think there's something in writing what you know. Um, I definitely um, have done that myself. Um, you know, I'm starting now to write characters far different from myself yet, you know, for my next book. I don't think any of the characters are like me, but um, I think you can do it, you know, when you're writing what you know, you can do it with this real authenticity and, um, you know, you, you can really, you you're full of stories you're full of and you don't realize you know how interesting your life will be to people people that have had a similar life and people that haven't because those that have had a similar life to you will just feel so um empowered by seeing a story you know like their life on a page and people that haven't will learn and they'll they'll develop empathy and they'll be intrigued and they want to know um and i think every life is interesting and i think that's um something that you know, I tell young people, you know, start with what you know. Obviously, if you have things that you want to, you know, write fantasy and write, uh, you know, like sci-fi, like that's cool, you know, and, and you'll know that because maybe you're reading fantasy and reading sci-fi. So you, you know how to do that. But put something um, authentic in there, whether it's the feeling, the, uh, you know, the, the kind of the scenario you can set something in space, but it could still feel like something, you know, so um, don't feel like you have to, um, invent something from scratch because you're full of stories and you've, you've lived a life already. So I'd say use some of your own uh, material, but don't feel you have to, because I know people feel pressured, like if they're say black or queer or both, like that they feel they have to put that into their books in their writing and you don't have to, um, but you know, the, the, there's an appetite for it and people want to read it. So don't be shy. I don't think people won't want to read it because they will. 
but don't feel like you have to write it because that's your identity. You can write outside of your identity. That's totally um, cool to do. That's great advice. I love that. Um, where was the other one I wanted to connect to that? Oh, can you tell us uh, anything about your YA work in progress? Yeah, um, it's called Only on the Weekends and it's about a love triangle. And so it's about a, a boy having to move to another city uh, like 400 miles away from where his boyfriend lives and um, having to go on weekends to visit him. And then where his new home is meeting another boy and <laughs> um, <laughs> having to choose. Um, so yeah, it's a classic love triangle and it's, it's been really fun. And it was kind of inspired by the fact that I've moved um, from where I lived in London to um, living now in Glasgow in Scotland. And um, so I'm, I'm setting this new book here in Scotland, which is gonna be really fun because I'm kind of fresh here. I've only been here a year. So I'm kind of seeing it with new eyes and an outsider's perspective. And that's kind of what I'm putting into the book. Um, nice. Someone moving somewhere and, and seeing it with that perspective. So that's been really fun for me to kind of like take those observations and put them into this character. Um, but yeah, so I'm writing a bit of, of romance and, and, and kind of tough decisions needing to be made. And it's, it's really fun so far. And, and taking on the thruples. <laughs> Well, um, yeah, I, 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 I mean, I can't give away the ending. <laughs> okay, so this is the last question, and I think this is a perfect way to end. How do you find joy in times like this, and what gives you hope? Just um, two questions. Yeah, um, for me, like FaceTiming with my nieces, I've got two nieces, and they're four years old and two years old, and they're called Ariana and Andia. And whenever I speak to them, like they want to, be playful they want to tell me little things that happened in their day they want to show me their toys like I send them books and just like when they I send them clothes and when I see them wearing like the cute things I've sent them I just feel like yay um so I think young people in general but like I think it's when you're related to them there's a kind of different excitement you get um you know from you know seeing my nieces grow and develop and wanting to kind of make this world um somewhat nicer for them you know and all the kids and so that is is kind of the thing that gives me joy and hope you know knowing that the we've got you know the amazing young people I get to work with who are like breaking out of you know labels and barriers and and seeing things with um you know renewed you know not even renewed energy that fresh energy and it gives me a renewed energy to see how young people look at the world and the possibilities they see for it being better um, so yeah, my own nieces and then all the young people that I get to work with. Well, thank you for writing The Black Flamingo thank and you. for um, creating possibilities for young people and especially black and brown young boys um, who might be gay or queer or bi um, to be able to accept themselves and the process. So thank you so much for your work and your words. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you for the great conversation. I really loved it. This was lovely. Thank you so much. I want to thank you both. Thank you, Dean and Emil. Thank you for such a powerful conversation. Um, I'm telling everyone now, if you have not gotten your copy of The Black Flamingo, we are selling it at the shop.com Please get your copy. I, I really can't even stress after this conversation how important this work is. Um, as a queer person myself, I love, love, love this text. And I just want to thank you all for such a powerful conversation. Our next conversation coming up will be called is called Back to School with Black comics and graphic novels. Please stay here. Um, actually, not for too long. You don't want to sit here for an hour, but you want to come back at 4.30 for this conversation. Please remember to refresh your screen so that you're getting the most update conversation. Again, at 4.30, we'll be right back here for Back to School with Black comics featuring Jerry Kraft, Greg Anderson, Elise, Liz Montag, Shauna Grant, and Deidre Holman. Blue text on a background composed of a light, semi-transparent grid of headshots for all of the festival guests. The text reads, for the full schedule, visit www.schombergcenterlitfest.org.